Hi, everybody, and welcome to um, our event called My Campus is Racist. My name is Stephen Kamara. I am your BAME Network Chair. Sasha? Yep. Hi, I'm um, Sasha Langevald, and I'm your Students' Union President. And today we will be talking about... Um, so our purpose today is to actually talk about racism on campus, systematic racism, and just race as a whole. Um, obviously, in light of what's currently going on, so um, the George Floyd incident. Sorry about that. So, in light of actually what has recently been going on in the world, so the likes of the George Floyd murder, which has led to several protests globally, uh, we have seen uh, a few uh, um, protests in the UK, as well as in the likes of America, um, America, Palestine, all over the world. So. We would just like to talk about the racism on our campus and, you know, the steps that the university is make, uh, taking to make the change that we would like to see for BAME students. So, Sasha, I'll hand the floor back on to you. Thank you, Stephen. Um, so I'm just going to go through a few disclaimers for the session of how it's going to be run um, and basically what you can expect will be happening. Um, but I just wanted to let everyone know that this is a very flexible event. So it's just about having a conversation with the university about how we can move forward. Um, so just to start with just technical, um, I guess, um, awareness is that there will be like a 20 second delay in um, the video footage of just changing as we go live. Um, and there is also a captions function for anyone who needs to use it. It's on the right hand side under settings. So if you click it, um, it would be able to to work for you. Um, it might, you know, say things that I don't say, maybe because I speak too fast, but it would basically um, be auto automated for you. Um, the event will be recorded, so we will be publishing this after the event and all comments and questions that are put um, on the event and in, in the chat function box will also be recorded and taken, um, taken away after. If students don't have the, the, the chance or the opportunity to raise anything that they would like to raise during the session, we will be launching a survey um, that you would be able to raise your concerns with, which we will take forward um, in doing basically another um, in conversations event with um, key members of the university. Um, so I'm just going to read just checking up on my agenda so I don't miss everything. Um, and just to note as well, because I know a lot of um, students are interested in the obviously the investigation going on with um, the student, but what we can say is there's a formal investigation, so we can't comment any further on that. Um, and once that that's over, then um, then we will see what we what we can do within our means. Um, and I just wanted to say that we'll go into a Q&A session. So how it will be run is we'll later have a Q&A session that gives students the opportunity to also ask questions to the university. We have, um, Stephen and I, looked at different themes. So we'll be asking three questions per theme. So we're looking at a sense of belonging. So if you want to just dot down, for example, the theme so you can ask the questions when we, when we ask them a bit later, is a sense of belonging, intersectionality, and intersectionality in the sense of... Um, I've got it on my paper here so I don't mess it up, <laughs> in the sense of a means in which different identities marks and shapes one's experience. For example, me myself as a black person who is also identified as a woman and is female with a disability, I have different experiences um, to Stephen who is um, a heterosexual male um, who is black. So it's all about intersectionality where the different identities that you that you have also um, basically mean you would you would receive different experiences for them. The next one we would also be talking about is physical um, aggregate ag aggravated violence. Um, so looking at, for example, um, things like campus security, how they interact with students. Um, and then we want to speak about microaggressions in services, in Kent Union, in student support and well-being, um, in timetabling, for example, and co-op. But those that list is not obviously um, the list could go on, for example, so you don't need to, it doesn't need to be around those things. Um, and then we want to talk about overt racism and whether students actually have confidence in the reporting tools um, and the procedures. So just to give you a sense of, you know, the type of questions that um, we want to ask also to get a broad sense of the things that students are currently feeling. Um, this event is about finding solutions. And I think Stephen and I can't stress this enough is we want to have a conversation with the university, with the union, um, as well as students to see what we can make 
to have tangible change. We can have so many conversations about what we want to achieve, but we need to know how we're going to get there. So, for example, we want you to be as honest as you can be, but not spiteful. So I would say if you have any beef or problems with specific member of staff, um, this isn't necessarily the forum for it. Um, and if you want to go through a complaints procedure, then we, we can support you with that. But this is basically to find out, look at themes that are arising with students, find out solutions, get recommendations from students and hear what you want the university and the union to do to change. Um, so roughly the agenda will basically be Stephen and I will speak for a little while telling you about our experiences as well as recommendations that we would like for the union as well as the university. The university will introduce itself, we'll introduce the panel um, and also give them a chance to, you know, speak to some students um, and see what they're currently working on. Um, but before we start, I want to just say that, you know, if you if, if you need extra support or experiencing a lot of things right now, um, student support and wellbeing are there to support you and you can um, access some free counselling sessions. So I'll give it back to Stephen. So um, in regards to today, so before I actually go on to actually introduce our lovely panel, um, I want to talk about my experience at the University of Kent. So I'm a fourth year student. Um, I study accounting and finance. Um, last year I actually did my placement year. I've previously been the ACS president and I'm currently the BAME Network Chair. Uh, one thing over the past four years that I think um, the university could actually work on is diversity within the um, workplace in terms of staff. Now one thing I do believe I give kudos to a lot of people is the recently started BAME Network Chair, uh, BAME, um, start BAME Staff Network which I believe is is uh, something which enables staff that are of BAME heritage to actually um, connect not only with themselves, but the likes of students. And this in itself, I think, is good for the students. However, we do need more diversity within the workplace so that uh, uh, students have a lot more people that they can work with and that they can work to, uh, towards and that people that, let me say, for example, that they see within themselves. Um, also, in the likes of that, I, I, um, one thing I believe that needs to be worked on as well is the likes of um is the likes of um students actually feeling i feel like sometimes as well students feel as though they are scared into, uh, to go into sabbatical roles or other roles because they're scared of how they might be painted or the opportunities that the university presents towards them so therefore they they they, they feel maybe threatened or better still frightened to go into these kind of positions Sasha. Yeah, I'll just wait for it to change. Yeah, thank you, Stephen. Um, just on touching on what Stephen has said, um, so I've been a, well, I was a student from 2015 to 2018, and then I was a sabbatical officer for two years. Um, my experiences, I think, vary, um, and also that plays a part in intersectionality, and that's why it's important to identify that. Um, but I think what Stephen said, for example, about students wanting to go for sabbatical roles um, and stuff like that, I think it's, it's very true. Um, I know um, just speaking from experience and I won't speak, for example, on Milade, it has been challenging basically trying to, to fight for change, but also trying to fight the pushback that you get within your role being um, a black woman. Um, and it hasn't been easy um, and I can see why students are hesitant, but, you know, at the same time, we need students to, to fill these spaces because we need we need your voice, if, if, if I'm honest. Um, and I know we have, for example, um, a, di a diverse team going forward, um, but we need, you know, um, BAME students to push for leadership positions because you can have your voice heard and you can make that change. And I think Stephen and I, as well as Omolade, are, are statements to that. Um, talking about recommendations, what I would recommend to the university, and I think they have, they have been listening, as well as the union, is more diversity in staff. I think that 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 is just evident. Um, and having more diversity in staff would, would make students feel like they can, you know, see themselves in the union as well as the university. Um, and we've noticed that being a sabbatical officers, um, Omolade and I, in the sense that students come up to us and they say, you know, I see myself in the union because I, I feel like I can can, you know, have my experience heard and listened to. So I think diversity in staff is a definitely a key key part. But it's also conversation. I think we need to keep this dialogue going about, you know, whether students feel like they're part of the campus, what goes wrong, but not only identifying what goes wrong, 
identifying how we can change that to make sure we move forward. And I guess that's that's all I can say for now. And I know there's a lot of work, especially for the union to also take on. Um, so this session is not just about the university, it's also about the union. So so do make, make sure you raise your comments because we are here to listen um, and answer you know, any any concerns that we can, but more to, to listen and to have that dialogue. Stephen? Sorry, I do apologize. I actually had to unmute myself. Um, so moving swiftly on, I would like to um, introduce our lovely panel. Um, so started from um, Richard, if you could just introduce yourself and just let us know your role in the university. Yeah, I'm very happy to do so. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Richard Reese. I'm the Deputy Vice Chancellor, Education and Student Experience. Uh, I've been at the university oh, a big two and a half months now, uh, which has been the strangest experience because not being on campus, taking up a new role, trying to, to interact with both staff and with students uh, from afar is a very strange and different experience. But I'm really happy to, to, to be taking part um, this evening. And, uh, and obviously, many of the things that we're discussing will form part of my portfolio moving forward. Um, it would be Karen, if you could introduce yourself as well, please. Yeah, absolutely. I'm hope. Yeah, I've got the live uh, sign. Um, I'm Karen Cox. Uh, I'm the vice chancellor here at the University of Kent. Um, I joined the university in August 2017. Um, and uh, I think, as um, Richard has alluded to, um, in terms of the, the strangeness of the last few months with um, the, the pandemic that we've all been dealing with, I think um, that actually we're, we're all in uh, incredibly challenging times. So um, I, I think the fact that we can uh, use this opportunity and this technology to actually get together and continue what I believe are um, really important conversations that, that we need to have um, is great. And so thank you to um, both my colleagues that are uh, with us um, this evening, but also um, to, to Sasha and, and Stephen as well. It's, uh, it's great um, that, that we can get together like this. And to all, all of those that um, I hope are going to be asking questions, sharing views, um, genuinely want to, to listen. And, um, and I think as Sasha's already said, I'm committed to making sure that, that we follow up um, with with future listening events as well, and um, and looking at how we're progressing this uh, this work. So, so uh, glad to be here and um, hand back to Stephen. Thank you very much, Karen. Um, Christina, if you could just introduce yourself as well, please. Hi, everybody. I'm Christina Hughes. Um, I have an advantage over Richard because I joined Kent as an interim in, which means I'm on a contract, short-term contracts, in October and did his job until he started um, in March. And for the past couple of months, I've been looking after student services, um, which I will continue to do until August time. And I'm also very thrilled to be here. Um, absolutely uh, believe we have to listen. And um, our purpose today is actually to start doing that listening. Thank you so much, Casino. And Mark Arnold? Yep, I'm now live. Uh, good evening, everyone. Mark Arnold, I'm the Head of Security and likewise, I'm really glad that I'm here. Uh, I've been at the campus for two years, uh, so know quite a few of the faces, uh, and uh, I'm looking forward to hearing what everyone's got to say this evening. Thank you, Mark. And last but not least, um, Mr. Dave Thomas. Thank you, so if you could just introduce yourself, please. We can't hear you. <laughs> OK, are we live? Yes, we are. Yes. Hi, everyone. Good evening. I feel like a veteran. I've been at the university since 2015. So that seems like an awfully long time in comparison to my colleagues. But um, I am a project manager in the School of Sport and Exercise Science on the Student Success Project. And um, a lot of students across the university would have seen a, a person in a similar role to mine or a student success lecturer within their school. I also have an advantage whereby I'm also a student, so I'm a PhD student. Um, so that, you know, I, I believe that gives me that sort of advantage, me sitting in that third space. Um, what would I say about myself? I've had the opportunity to interact with 
quite a lot of students over the past five years. And I'm very delighted to be part of this conversation to facilitate this discussion. But before we do that, I would want to just leave a small quote with you because I think this is quite important. Um, and it goes like this, change will not come if we wait for some other person or some other time. We are the ones we've been waiting for. We are the change that we seek. So I'll just leave those words to simmer for a bit. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Thomas. Really do appreciate those words. Um, so just to begin with, I want to put a question out to everybody that's on this lovely panel. Um, so the question is, what is the university currently doing around racial harassment? Who would like to start off? <laughs> um, Karen, I'll, I'll open that up to you, Mrs. Cox. Do you want me to start? Uh, I, I'm happy to, to, to start, Christina, and then I, if it's OK, I, I, I will hand over to you. Um, okay. So, so I think I think um, there are uh, a number of ways of, of kind of engaging with that that question. I think I think first of all we've got to acknowledge um, that that harassment is happening, um, and often I think um, that's actually quite difficult to be able to, to face and to say this is real, this is happening, and happening in a range of ways. So, so I think one of the really important things that we've all got to do is um, acknowledge and then also acknowledge in a way that recognises um, that, that these are real experiences and need to be heard. Um, I think that we've got um, a number of mechanisms that we have in place across the university for reporting um, harassment. But I, uh, and again, I would welcome um, feedback from uh, colleagues and from students on this, um, that actually we've got to do better in terms of raising awareness about what to report, how to report, what will happen, people feeling safe um, reporting and understanding um, where, where all of that goes. And um, so whilst, whilst we can say we've got some of these things, actually how effective they are, how sensitive they are, how well um, used and positioned they are and how they're experienced by, by people using them, I think it's really, we've got to recognise that, that we've got more to do uh, on that as well. So, so for me, I wanted to acknowledge that it's something we've got to um, really face into. It is something that we've got, we've got some mechanisms, but how do we ensure that they're better? Um, and then how do we ensure that people feel that, that they're safe to use them and that those responding to those um, issues that are raised genuinely are able to to engage and, and get some kind of perspective on what's actually being reported and, and able to respond properly. So um, I just wanted to sort of set that out in terms of where I think we are as a, as a university and um, uh, happy to hand over to Christina. Christina, if you've got maybe okay. a bit more detail around some of that, that would be great. So we do have um, reporting tools. So INC, for example, is a reporting tool for harassment. We also have um, harassment coordinators um, who are nominated to um, you know, support colleagues or to students in, in situations where they feel that uh, there's something happening and um, it's not a good situation. I would say this, um, in terms of uh, where we are and where we've been and where we need to go. So a lot of the work we've done, and it's been driven across the sector actually, um, certainly via things like the Me Too movement or OFS, the Office for Students regulatory frameworks, have really strengthened the work that universities done around sexual harassment. And there is a, a, a very strong kind of cadre of work that's been happening at Kent in that area. And that is sector wide. And that in fact, it's it's subject to a consultation at the moment, a national consultation to strengthen that area of work. What happens then, of course, is that um, an institution is geared to one area of work and then the other parts uh, get relatively neglected. Um, we are now working very and very, um, uh, you know, proactively with Sasha, 
on s some of these issues and she might want to come in at this point um, just to describe, you know, um, the current conversations. But I think the other thing is that we have to think about is it's too late when the event has happened. Actually, it's about prevention. It's about making sure all of our students feel safe, they feel secure and they are not harassed. I mean, you know, for me, that would be your ideal situation. We're clearly not there. We're not there in society. We're not there at Kent. But that for me would be the end goal. But in the meantime, we do have these tools um, and we are, you know, absolutely now talking about switching gear around them. So, Sasha, I don't know if you wanted to say a bit more. Oh, I'm live, sorry. Um, so what I've been working with the university on in the last um, couple of weeks, but it has also been um, throughout the year, is um, speaking about how we can basically have more ethnic diversity on, for example, university council, or how we can ensure that there is um, diversity in terms of race on high level bodies of the university. But that's just a few of the things. But what we've what we've come up recently is four recommendations for the university and um, what we've done in the last few days is we have looked at the non-academic student regulations um, and we have basically changed them we have made a new section um, called hate incidences so um, in previous years or before we we changed them what would be called um, how do I say how what would be within um, hate incidences would be called unacceptable behavior and that would be one big category with um, different things that don't necessarily link to protected characteristics i.e race or gender um, or sexuality so we've changed that so now there is a section that says um, hate incidences the protected characteristics and then it also has the consequences of what that would look like um, and in some cases where um, you know, say student doesn't necessarily get exclusion, what we've added in or what, I, what I've asked to be added in and it's been approved and accepted or getting approved at Senate tomorrow is um, adding in an EDI training. So, for example, students who are reported to do some sort of, say, racial harassment um, um, incident, um, what they would have to go through is an EDI uh, educational learning purpose, because at the end of the day, what we don't want is for people to continuously doing you know things that are wrong and not understanding why that they're wrong and continuing to go out there and harass other students for example so that's something that we're working on um and one of the other things are is our zero tolerance program and i will go more in depth about the zero tolerance program because i know i can see some of the questions already that have been published linking to to this but we want to expand our zero zero tolerance program so currently it works to accredit um, bars and clubs to make sure that um, there is a accredit accreditation scheme to make sure students feel safe in terms of reporting sexual assault and harassment. And we want to we want to expand that. We want to include all types of harassment to make sure students understand uh, and feel comfortable, say, going to some sort of restaurant or bar or even on campus and feeling that the staff will know how to handle their situation, be that a microaggression or overt racism. It's something that still needs to be learned and understood. And then one of the other things, which I guess is more the structural change, and I know we had some questions on um, Instagram on on this, and I can I can go further on what it means, is we want to create a racial harassment steering group. And the main reasons for this is we need to start somewhere. And I know in, in other institutions and in other universities, for example, they've had these structures for years and nothing's changed. But what we want to do is continue this conversation. We want to continue this dialogue, embed it within the university, create these formal structures, have the right people in the room and come up with solutions. We, I think we're all at the point where we're tired of talking um, and I can see a lot of um, a lot of the comments. And I think I think everyone's tired of just talking. So I think everyone just doesn't understand um, in some ways how to get from A to B. And in order to get that, that's why we have these conversations and we want to keep this dialogue going because we need students to tell us, for example, what do you want to see the university do? What do you want to see the, the union be? Um, so we can start making that change. So all of these are actually currently ongoing. So they've been, they're working on right now, for example, the group is going to be to be created um, to leading up to the EDI strategy or EDI committee from the university 
Um, but yeah, so those are just a few things that are currently happening, but I would be happy to obviously go into the other questions later, Stephen. OK, I just wanted to also ask as well, um, just to interject as well, in terms of the schemes that um, obviously Karen, Christina and obviously Sasha has mentioned, um, how will the momentum be kept? So will you be doing focus groups? How often will these focus groups be going on from, you know, and how will we make sure that investigations are properly, you know, conducted and when certain uh, incidents occur? Out to the floor. Out to the floor. OK, I think I um, I'm happy to I'm happy to make some suggestions on that front. Right. Um, I think it's quite important with, with, with these issues to one, as um, the vice chancellor has already done, acknowledge that they exist. So that's the first part um, leading to a solution. But the, the second bit and probably the most important um, aspect is to open dialogue. So you need dialogue from all key stakeholders. And in this um, respect, I will say the students are our key stakeholders at the end of the day student incomes, pays, you know, university staff salaries, right? So dialogue, a clear channel of uh, uh, our pathway to have this dialogue and a 360 degree feedback loop. So when you're having these discussions, students will be informed of the decisions that are made. So a 360 degree feedback loop in terms of policies, right? Sasha spoke, you spoke about um, some um, prospective uh, policy agendas on the way. And I think the student voice is imperative in these conversations, but also it's educational and transformative. So that is that is another key aspect because we in order to be the change that we want to see, we have to be solution focused. So we want the voices to to raise the concerns, but we also want the voices to raise the solutions, not that the, the victims should create their own solutions. That's not what I'm suggesting. But what I'm suggesting is the victims can be a part of the solution, right? But, sec but se the second aspect is the university has already made a commitment to act, right? And, you know, this is where the students should feel empowered to actually hold the university to account at some point, you know, to see if these actions are met. And I've got no reason to believe that they won't be met because we've already established that there is a commitment. So I would say a, a conversation and a, and, a, and, a, and a platform for continuous dialogue is the primary vehicle that can move this agenda forward. I think also before before I um, relinquish the microphone. Is the acknowledgement that uh, when we speak about BAME as in black, Asian and minority ethnic. For statistical purposes this identifier is probably appropriate, you know, in higher education, we use that for statistical purposes, but an appreciation of the nuances and the, the, the different demographic groups within this group is vitally important because the experiences are different for all of these groups. So we can, we can say that black students or black staff or people who identify uh, as having an Afro-Caribbean heritage are disproportionately affected within this group. So the worst affected group within the BAME group are the black groups, which we are seeing now. We're seeing the effects of that now. So I think is you know, just to have the understanding of the needs of the groups within this group and the multiplicity of factors that promote this inequality in, in experiences and outcomes for these groups. I do apologize. So <laughs> literally, I just keep on muting myself and then coming back on. Um, Richard, Richard you, would you like to have some um, say on this as well? Or do you think everybody's, everybody's kind of said your uh, frame of mind? Uh, no, I'm, I'm happy to add to things as well. I mean, I mean, you know, the, the university is, is absolutely right to to recognize that that these things, these things happen, you know, as an institution, as any institution would say, you know, we, we will not tolerate uh, any racist incidents that occur, but that really only goes into 
things that uh, tend to be overtly racist. What we really need to tackle is is the the whole gamut of things that are on there. And and you know, Sasha mentioned some of the some of the kind of EDI training things. I, I'm struggling to see why we wouldn't do that actually for all students and all staff, not just target it in any particular way. I mean, that there there are things to be. Um, you know, we 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 want to raise awareness of this. You know, clearly there is a you know now is the time to, to be able to do that. Uh, others will be able to describe better what's already gone on at the institution than I have because I'm, as I say, a relative newcomer. But but I, I I'm you know certainly going forward, I'm really keen that we we have this right at the very front of the agenda. You know, you know the, the University of Kent wants to be an inclusive institution for both its staff and its students. That's that's part of the, the DNA of the organisation and it needs to, to, to go on in that basis. But we need to do that without just saying that, you know, it can't just be platitudes. We need we need firm and, and concrete courses of action that can really allow us to be able to, to say that. Like I say, others will be able to, to, to comment more on, on what's happened in the past. But going forward, it's definitely going to be on the, the forefront of my agenda. Thank you very much, everyone, for everyone's input. Um, now moving swiftly on, we'd like to actually open the floor to the students. So now is the time for you guys to actually share your experience um, on the chat. Um, and however, if you actually, if let me say, for example, your uh, um, question does not get answered on the chat, there will be a, a survey going around after the event where you could actually fill it in and actually write your uh, certain experiences that you've gone through and what recommendations that you'd like for the university. So um, how this Q&A is going to work is that we're going to have about five subheadings. Um, and I'm basically going to open the floor up to, um, with a question uh, to our lovely panelists. And then um, we will pick from uh, uh, the questions that you guys have asked concerning the subheading and then obviously now um, give them a chance to actually up, uh, uh, answer it. So firstly, the first subheading is uh, the topic of a sense of belonging at the University of Kent. Now, in 2018, we saw a Nazi sign was put up on campus on, I believe, uh, one of Elliot, yeah, the Elliot building. And um, a question I want to put out to um, everyone is, how quick was the uh, university uh, to respond? And what is the university doing to support BAME students within the student support and wellbeing? Is there enough racial diversity amongst the counsellors to reflect the student population? So whoever would like to go first, the floor is open. If I deal with it, it's Mark Arnold here, security, just purely from an operational. As soon as we became aware, uh, my staff attended and to actually work out what it was. Uh, obviously, we then tried to screen it off uh, and check CCTV. And apart from obviously informing the executive group, one of the first things we actually did was speak to the police because that's a criminal matter. All right. So that was taken very seriously and was investigated both by the police and by the university to try and identify who was responsible for that offence. So it was dealt with initially very uh, quickly because it was also at the time there's another a number of other uh, extremist right uh, graffiti put on a building which was the three triple k's put on a building as well so again that was investigated okay. karen yeah uh, oh oh i'm now live um, <laughs> not only do you have to manage the microphone you've got to wait for the live thing to come out. <laughs> okay so um i suppose i i um I have to admit that um, recent events have, um, you know, the, the, the George Floyd incident, really the, the, the sort of opening up of, of conversations around Black Lives Matter being absolutely brought to the fore, has, has been, um, for me, uh, quite humbling. Um, I, I think the incident that um, you, you describe, um, you know, we, we can all, uh, you know, sit here and say it's absolutely awful. Um, but I think one of the things that um, it's making me think about is, you know, we can have our responses. We can have our, yeah, we, we and Mark's absolutely right. It was screened off. It was, yeah, you know, we, it was reported. It was, uh, but it's actually, um, and, and again, I think this is partly about us trying to learn what, what do we need to be doing better and differently? Because actually that being there um, and then us thinking operationally how we deal with it is quite different to how it feels for everybody who's seeing it. 
feeling unsafe, feeling frightened, um, feeling that 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 is happening on on our campus. Um, and I'm looking at the the questions and the um, and the challenges in the chat. Absolutely right. You know, how do we move from from saying we understand how it feels, and of course, how, how you know, how do you understand another person's experiences without actually listening and sitting down and listening to them? Um, and moving this from from rhetoric and moving it from we have a policy for this, we have training for this, we have something else for this to to actually um, turning this into something that we acknowledge um, where we've fallen short. And, and I think we absolutely just have, have to acknowledge that I can't. You know, there are things in the questions here that I have to put my hands up and say, I can't I can't answer that. I, I don't know um, or we've not addressed it or we thought we'd addressed it, but we obviously haven't. Um, and for me, there's something about um, how do we collectively learn from each other about what what we each need to see from each other? How do we start to identify maybe one or two things that um, you know we can address quite quickly? I think Sasha's raised a number of points that um, are about how do we approach um, things around um, you know academic disciplines, conduct, um, policies around examinations. Again, things in the chat being raised about how will the university support Black Asian minority ethnic students in relation to the the COVID response, which with my, I, I work in the NHS as well, with my NHS I'm very conscious that we have a, a BAME staff community that are facing real challenges in relation to their own health and well-being uh, in terms of being um, more affected by, by COVID. So, so I suppose I'm, I'm trying to re reflect that um, we don't always get this right. We don't always um, listen well and we don't respond well. And I think that example about the, the Nazi symbols, the KKK symbols, uh, are, are one um, incident where, where actually it must have been really disturbing for, for those students that saw that, that reported that, that then wanted to know what was happening. And it all gets lost in the machinery of, of the university. And I suppose one of the things we need to take away, not just from today, but, but going forward, is, is how do we turn the rhetoric into reality? Um, and how do we do that um, in, a, in an authentic way? And I suppose I'm, I'm admitting we, we don't have, have all the answers and I'm wanting to work with, with our staff and our students to try and address that. But can I, if I just may, and then I'll, I'll hand over, I think again, points in the questions in the chat about um, diversity around our staff body. Um, you know, if I look at our um, uh, equality and diversity report, we've got 11% um, of our staff body Declare themselves as, as, uh, as fitting into the sort of BAME category, but but that in no way reflects our student body, which I would um, uh, say from again from latest figures is three four times that that number uh, of staff. And 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 again, our, our students are telling us that 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 they don't see um, themselves reflected in our staff body, and we we've, we've got to do more about that in terms of how we are recruiting into the university retaining staff in the university, enabling them to have careers in the university that, that also makes it a, a place where colleagues from a range of backgrounds and experiences feel that, that this is a place for them. So again, I acknowledge that the, um, that the statistics are, are, are not good there and they're reflected in the questions that have been posed by students in the, in the um, Q&A about how do, I, how do we get more and diversity in our staff body so that again people feel safe, feel listened to and feel that they're engaging with, with people who have similar experiences to them. I'll shut up. <laughs> Lovely, thank you very much Karen. Uh, would anyone else like to speak? Um, can I just respond to the um, student services uh, and student support and well-being issue because that is something I have heard since I've been in this role in the last month or so. We're in the middle of a reorganisation in student services and we are um, part of that reorganisation is to uh, recruit new mental health advisors. Those mental health advisors we have already included in the job descriptions. We are asking for particular interests and knowledge in these areas. We're also looking at a positive recruitment strategy. Uh, and I say this uh, 
partly because I absolutely understand that we can sit here talking all day and talking next year and talking the year after. Um, but I, I just want to signify in a very small way, we are trying to be responsive where we can. And this is one area because we are in this reorganisation just at the moment um, that we're able to respond to some of the concerns. The, the other thing I would say um, in terms of how student support and wellbeing works is, of course, and it, it links to Sasha's com, you know, questions around intersectionality. We cannot cover all of the different forms of issues that students will bring to us. It's not possible. We don't have that diverse a student base, a staff base to cover all of the intersectionalities. But we do bring in external people. So, for example, for, for, for example, a transitioning student, we do not have anybody in our staff body and student support, as I understand, who is in that situation. But we can find somebody who is appropriate. And I think these are the ways in which we are quite, you know, we are trying to be more conscious about um, about what's needed. And of course, the other bit goes back to appropriate staff development and appropriate training. And in the questions in the box there, a lot of this is how is my classroom safe? Why have you recruited, you know, a, a racist lecturer? Why, you know, we we you know, part of it is actually how we develop the cultures we set and the training and provision we set for our staff. And, and again, in student services, we are um, just putting in place, we're, we're exploring some ways in which we can move from the, the, the basic unconscious bias training that all staff have access to into these more deeper forms of staff development. OK, thank you very much, Christina and Karen. Um, just moving swiftly on. Um, to the next topic, which is intersectionality. Um, so obviously earlier, um, Sasha actually gave a definition. Uh, Sasha, would you just like to go over the definition again so that people who are viewing could know? Yep, I can give the definition again. Um, so it is the means by which different identities mark and shape others' experiences. Uh, and an example of that is me as a black um, person who is heterosexual, who identifies as a woman, who is female as well, has a disability. Um, and it's and it's key to recognize this because me, although I'm a black woman, I have different experiences, for example, to Stephen, who is um, a black man, and I will have different experiences to to other, for example, people who um, who basically belong to the LGBT plus community because I don't belong there. So intersectionality is a really key part of understanding how we actually make students also feel like a sense of belonging. But it's really important because I think there was a comment, Stephen, um, if, you, if you want to highlight it, I think in the published section, um, it was around, um, let me see if I can find it really quickly. Yeah. It was around intersectionality and we and I can scroll and find it if you if you want to carry on, but it was around intersectionality and basically talking about how um, some people might feel like, um, say, LGBT is prioritized over other, for example, um, BAME and um, um, other communities. And I think this is key because this is, you know, intersectionality means that even within different communities, such as black, Asian and minority ethnic communities, is they are also people who identify with these things. So interse intersectionality is very key because it encompasses a lot of different people who identify with a lot of different parts. And those different parts impact how they will experience just life with society, with institutions and everything like that. So it's a really key thing to understand um, as a lot of students would, would be basically impacted by it. Okay, thank you very much, Sasha. Thank you very much, Sasha. Um, so just going off of what I've got here, so first of all, during the welcome week is the expect respect module compulsory um, and how is it utilised to ensure new stu students understand intersectionality? Also, um, 
a question put out by an anonymous person was, in regards to the importance of having uh, more BAME staff, part of the strike this year was on the play, uh, was on the pay gaps within university that also needs to be closed. There are some numbers, black academic staff earn 12, uh, 12 to 13% less than the white, their white colleagues. Women in higher education earn on average 15.1% less than men, and disabled people in higher education earn 8.7% less than non-disabled colleagues. These, these are the numbers of the university and college union. How is the University of Kent working towards closing uh, these gaps? Um, the person also gave a suggestion by saying, would it be um, necessary to have diversity of, uh, officers monitor the hiring processes? Um, so would uh, Richard, would you like to start? Uh, yeah, happy to do so. Uh, I think in terms of uh, some of the responses to intersectionality, inter, uh, I think Christina gave uh, in her last response gave you know the, the kind of overall approach there that uh, that we certainly are not in a position at the moment to to be able to cover all the bases um, as it were. But you know we're very happy to to try and get uh, issues uh, resolved so that that we can get into into the you know find someone as as Christina said who who is going through a particular process that that might be more relevant to to individuals. Um, in terms of uh, some of the other things that uh, that you've mentioned uh, about the compulsory nature of uh, some welcome week uh, courses. Uh, again, I think Christina can can uh, address that. I think the answer is yes, it is compulsory, but uh, uh, compulsion in that sense is a is a uh, something of an interesting concept. Uh, and in terms of the uh, the pay gaps uh, between uh, different sections. Um, again, I think I suspect Karen would be bound to just passing things on here, and that that, that wasn't the intention at all. Um, I mean, one one thing that was mentioned in the chat, which hasn't really come up yet, but perhaps it's relevant to raise here, is uh, about attainment differences between uh, between between groups of students. That's something that uh, the university is very well aware of, and a lot of the student success work that uh, that uh, Dave was talking about at the beginning is is really aimed to to try and you know close those gaps as much as possible. We are very ambitious targets for, for closing those gaps, but they are when, certainly when we started this work that those gaps were very wide uh, and you know that was was clearly an unacceptable part in there and a lot of the work around the student success part has really been trying to get those those gaps as small as they can be ideally so we can eliminate them in, in due course. It is a thing, uh, it is a, an issue that, that takes time to be able to work through the system though. Um, you know, incremental changes uh, year on year are great, that's, that's excellent, but we want to try and close those gaps as, as quickly as we possibly can. Christina, I don't know if you want to pick up the point about, uh, about Welcome Week. Okay, so expect respect is compulsory. The problem is the follow through actually making sure every student does it. So there is more work to be done there to make sure that students actually take that module. Um, there is also a review of the expect respect mo module happening at the moment. Um, yeah, so yes, it's compulsory. Not every student does it. We have work to do to make sure that that happens, but actually it also needs some updating. Can I also come to what I would call the uh, award gap rather than attainment gap? Because I think that switches the dynamic into is systematic uh, issues to look at rather than individualised um, people's capabilities. You, all, all students will know we have a no detriment safety net uh, policy this year, which is a particular calculation. We have run that calculation absolutely with concern to make sure it does not significantly impact certain groups of students. We will run that calculation again post awards to, to, to again make the measures of, of what's happening. This, this is something that is happening in other universities. What we understand from very, very early data is that BAME students do better in their exams and for some reason online exams. And it might be because students can choose what, you know, Kent's got a 48 hour window and it might be you can choose the time to do the exam that suits you better. We don't know. 
there is work to be done there but that is potentially a good news story if that's true and we won't know for a while that if there is a there is a form of examination where certain students do better than others we want to know the reasons why and that is also work that has to happen i'm not promising that's the outcome this is really early data and it's also uh, things that colleagues from across the sector are telling us but i do want to assure you we ran those calculations when we put in the no detriment cal uh, uh, algorithm because we're very conscious of the award gap. Christine, Christina, if I if I may, Christina, um, that segues nicely into. Um, yeah, sorry, if I may, that segues nicely into um, uh, another point that I'd like to illuminate. Um, so I'll do this by way of five um, different compartments. So I'll speak about a review of the past and I look into the future. So by way of the Student Success Project, um, since 2014, we have started that work and the work is continuing. So historically, it was a project and now that project title has been dropped and we are now incorporated and embedded into the, the fabric of the, you know, the operation of the university. So it's no longer a project. So we have reviewed the past. We are looking into the future. And one of the mechanisms which we use to operationalize this is um, an evidence based mechanism. So we use data, for example, the degree awarding gap, you know, looking at seminal research that tells us that after controlling for all factors, race is a statistically significant factor. Um, and this was among 65,000 graduates, right? So we have positioned that at the forefront of our investigations. And so we have not adopted a deficit approach whereby we blame the students. You know, there's a deficiency in the student. We have looked at a holistic picture. You know, what are the structures that are in place that are disproportionately affecting students? And how can we redress those, those structures? How can we eliminate and redress? Um, and we do this through evidence-based initiatives, right? We conduct empirical research and ethnographic research. We go out there, we speak to students, right? And then use their narratives, their stories, their lived experiences coupled with our data to formulate our, our strategies or inter interventions. What has come up on our agenda is the invisible problem. So the intersection of race and well-being. And this feeds into things like sense of belonging for our students. Again, that is high on our agenda. Um, these data has been presented to our university and we are actively working on strategies, holistic strategies to redress these. Um, and a, a fifth aspect is this sort of juxtaposition between the staff's experience and the students' experiences for the, the groups that are most affected. So when we look at equality, diversity, inclusivity, we realize that they are interlinked, they are independent, but are interdependent so for example a lot of the work that that's happening currently in the university will focus on accessibility for different groups right but what we are trying to do or what we have done in the project is to harmonize this you know intersectionally how does it affect disproportionately affect a group of students or which groups of students are most affected so going back to christina's point where uh, whereby we'll have a look at the data We'll analyze the data properly, intersectionally, and see which students are disproportionately affected, and then come up with evidence-based strategies to redress this and ensure that students aren't disadvantaged. Thank you very much, Mr. Thomas um, and, and, and Mrs. Hughes. Um, just going off of that as well, um, if we could just, just because we're short for time, if we could just keep answers quite limited as well, please. And also, um, we're just going to go to the next um, topic, which is physical aggravated violence uh, uh, on campus. Uh, an example being campus security. Now, a question that we received from the public was. Um, I saw one. So firstly was who do we report harassment to when the harassment is from the campus security? Um, your reporting tools consider individuals interaction instead of the systematic racism met to blame students, especially by security. 
So, yeah. Mark, if you just answer that, um, that'd be great. Yeah, I've been reading some of the, the questions that are coming up there, uh, and there is a theme, and I would just like to, to be very public. I don't tolerate racism by any of my staff, and one of the things that we've been saying is to anyone, if you see it, challenge it. Who do you report it to? Uh, there's a number of places. Uh, you can report it, obviously, by ink uh, to the student union. Uh, if it's about my staff in particular, then you've got a number of avenues there. You've got the state's complaint procedure, uh, and that's independently investigated. Uh, and then you can do this, the students uh, can put their own separate complaint in. But what I would encourage people to do, if you see something that you think we're not doing right, enter into a dialogue with my staff at the time, uh, and then uh, by all means, contact me or my deputy Lisa Collison, we have regular meetings with the student union heads uh, to actually find out what sort of service are we providing? Can we do it better? We are very keen that if we haven't got something right or we need to explain why we've done something, sometimes it is about explaining. Uh, I know there's one there and I'm going to quickly monopolise this just for a minute because there's a question there about posters uh, and there's been a, a request for me to explain what happened about the posters. Uh, some students and staff were putting posters up and at the time my staff did not realise who they were and they obviously went to check out who it was that was doing that because there has been a number of criminal acts that have been done and it became very apparent that when they spoke to those putting up the posters they were students and staff therefore they had a right to be on the campus. Part of our remit is to make certain it's a safe campus and therefore people that do not need to be on the campus we obviously remove. So there was a discussion there about that uh, and then I subsequently spoke to staff members about what had gone on. So it was in the initial uh, point finding out what was going on, why they were doing it. It was not about what was on the posters that was a problem. It was just trying to find out what was going on there about the posters. Does that answer those two questions very quickly? Because I'm conscious we're tight on time. And there's lots of other questions that people want to ask, Stephen. OK. Uh, um, another question asked. Was. So what training? So one we actually came up for ourselves before I actually going to the other ones was what training does campus security get in regards to EDI and student uh, contacts. Uh, is campus security reflective of the student po uh, population? Mm -hmm. OK, uh, all my staff do the designated EDI training for a start uh, and that's on there. Uh, as far as our staff just don't do security, we do uh, mental health, welfare, first aid. We do a whole gambit of stuff and security probably takes up less than half of what we do at any one time. Uh, when uh, I, I looked at my workforce and does it represent the community, uh, it is predominantly a white security. However, we do have out of the 50 odd members, I do have four that are black, Asian, minority, ethnic. I also have six female officers on top of that. And there's a number of other protected characteristics within the team. So we try and represent uh, the community and since I've been there we've been uh, getting people that are good problem solvers not necessarily those that were security or police it's more around how they do effective communications and they give a good service to the students. All right then thank you so much Nick. appreciate it. Um, Sasha would like to interject. Um. Yeah, so what, what I was just going to say on that, um, Mark, and I think this is something that, um, you know, has brought us here, for example, is what recommendations can we get from students? So it's just more of um, just a question to all the, the audience as well as staff, actually, is given obviously what Mark has just said, what do you recommend that the university as well as more, say, union um, in terms of other security, 
what do you want to see campus curie doing to change the way that they they interact with people to make sure that they feel safe on campus for example so given what mark has said about checking for example to see if they you know uh, were students or staff and uh, do they have the right to poster what do you want to see change about that to make sure that students and staff feel like they belong on campus in a sense so it's just more about to get the more of the audience to keep sending in your your thoughts and recommendations and also fill out the survey that we're going to be launching um, after the event and write your rec recommendations in if you don't if you think campus security can do more which i think we all here today to say the university and the union can definitely do more but we need to know what can we do and how we're going to do it so keep sending in your thoughts and fill out the survey and just keep sending in recommendations because that's what we're also here for. We want a way forward. Also, I'd just like to actually pose a question of my own to uh, Mark. So I had a friend in 2015 who was a student at the University of Kent. Uh, now, uh, a situation happened where somebody used his, uh, uh, well, threw away his utensils and stuff like that. Um, he then confronted the young lady. She then called the uh, police and campus security accusing him of actually attacking her. And in actual fact, there were witnesses in the actual kitchen that he wasn't doing so. Um, the way the situation was dealt with was even after campus security and the police had done their investigation um, and found that after interviewing everybody that he it actually, what he wasn't actually, and he didn't lay a hand on it, and it was more of a racial, uh, um, how can I put it, what's the word to use? A, racial like more or less a racial kind of like attacking yeah racial undertone by the young lady he was kicked out of his accommodation and wasn't allowed to come back and the girl didn't serve any level of punishment um i just want to say from my own aspects of things are investigations being done properly the types of investigation what type of investigations like what are the methods that are taken during these investigations and how do you know that you're uncovering uncovering the truth and in terms of uh, 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 making sure justice is served to people that are actually wrongly accusing people based on the um, colour of their skin. Right, uh, two elements to that. If it's a criminal investigation, then the, the criminal, the police investigation takes precedence and they operate on a much higher level of burden of proof. And there's obviously uh, anything that needs to be charged needs to go to the Crown Prosecution Service and it's got to pass a couple of tests one is the threshold test one is the public interest test so therefore you know it, it, it is to a higher standard when it comes to investigating on campus the initial facts evidence is collated by campus security it is then passed to the relevant investigating authority which in the past was the college masters so they will then pursue that investigation so that's if we do the initial scene preservation and capture, it then gets handed over. So we do not hand out any punishments. We do not investigate the matter. It gets passed either to the college masters or sometimes to uh, student uh, misconduct officer who deals with that. So it's just a bit of put a clarity there. All right then, thank you. Um, moving swiftly on, um, the next topic is microaggressions in services, um, i.e. the Kent Union, student support, um, well-being, timetabling and within the um, co-op shop. Um, so um, let me hand it over to you, Sasha. Um, yeah, I can answer that question or also just give more of um, maybe a, a broad view and also just touch upon other questions relating to the to the union specifically in the in the published lot. Um, so, for example, um, I think this one's a, a good a good question to ask because microaggressions is something that really impacts the people who experience it, but they have no proof that 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 it happens. It's a microaggression. It's very hard to to explain to others who might not, for example, experience it. Um, and I think this is key because it, it it basically encompasses belonging, it encompasses uh, intersectionality, you know, physical safety on campus, it encompasses everything that we're talking about today. But um, in, rela in relation to some of the questions that have come up on the chat is that um, 
we need to do more and I think we've, we've spoken about this before is diversifying our staff getting the right um, people in the room to basically support students when these happen as well as educating our staff so it's not just about educating new students it's about re-educating our staff who are currently there and keep re-educating people because things change all the time like I know someone for example mentioned the you know the term BAME is not representative of them Things like these are always changing. For example, we see things like people of color from America and it's more Americanized. But that's why we always need to re-educate people because, for example, the word BAME might change in five years. So it's really important to look at EDI and refresh it as soon as we can when new things come up. Um, so a couple of the questions that have been ans uh, asked basically on the chat is more around um, one is to do with obviously what we had is Black History Month with um, Zayn Malik and Sadiq Khan, but it's not necessarily um, as I think many of us would expect because we've, we've had similar questions like this, but it's more focusing on, um, for example, the, the question says in brief, um, why, are Asia, why are issues faced by Asians in Britain um, pushed down, for example, um, where were the marches and protests uh, when a British um, um, Arab was murdered in a racist UK. So I'm just trying to read it. And I think things like this are really important because it is also about dialogue, but it's also about it's about engagement is, for example, the union is here to support students. It is here to to help you raise your voice. For example, the protests done were not really done by Kent Union. It was done by student groups. It was done by the Black Lives Matter Kent. Um, and the union is here to support students. So if you tell us what you want to be done, then we will support you in facilitating that. So there is no reason why people can't um, come together and, and march. Um, I know that last year, I believe it was last year, um, a student who wasn't necessarily from the University of Kent was, was beaten up in the Canterbury City Centre. Um, and there was an organised march with the union and the community to basically say no to racism here in Canterbury. So the reason why I bring this up is because it's not necessarily focusing because I know I think when we when we speak about race and racial harassment, I think people tend to feel like people are focusing on individuals, but it's not necessarily about the individuals. It's about making sure we all come together to tackle these these uh, situations, but then also give light to things that are happening statistically speaking. Um, and then there's other questions on in regards to, um, for example, what can societies do to basically engage and stuff like that? I think, for example, we have so many cultural societies and they are very great in representing, you know, international students as well as students who are home, home students here. And I feel like people don't use them enough. What we wanted to do a couple of years back um, is to decolonize basically our experience. And that's basically linking student groups with cultural societies and let, letting them interact in, in some sort of engagement. because. In, until things happen, people don't necessarily think, oh, maybe it would be good to, you know, broaden my knowledge, broaden my experience. So that's one of the things that I would, you know, encourage students to, to get behind is, is, you know, communicate with other students, have an open dialogue. This this whole thing is about dialogue. Well, there are student groups out there. You just need to reach out to them and also ask them about the experience. And the last thing, sorry, Stephen, that I wanted to just ask is there was a really good one about, um, how will the university and SU work to meaningfully, meaningfully engage and consult black students about their experiences and lived experiences? Will the SU in particular move away from tokenistic, tokenistically consulting with a handful of students such as ACS and acting as if they're the counter um, per proper engagement? I think this is a definitely important answer. And the reason why I want to touch on this is because we have so many other cultural societies that represent, for example, black, Asian um, and minority ethnic students. And especially when we're talking about getting feedback and consulting students, we need to do that in all our student groups, not necessarily one. And I think this is basically touching on that. Um, and what we need to do is we need to have a full time full time staff member. And I briefly mentioned the zero tolerance program before. What we want to do is broaden zero tolerance out to have a physical staff member to focus on these issues, to work with student groups, to see what basically is is themes that are coming up and, and work to create actual recommendations moving forward. Um, because as I say, for example, me as a full time officer, we come and we go. Our longest term is two years and that's never enough to 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 live through like, like, how do I say, like structural change. 
So I feel like with a staff member there, hopefully that, you know, we can keep these conversations going and encourage more students to to make that connection. But I would say engagement and dialogue is key. And it's also about creating change, because I think a lot of people, we we see a lot of things happening, but we we don't hear about them. It's, it's also about empowering people to speak up. For example, if someone wants to do a protest um, in, in memory of, for example, the, the Arab British man that was killed or, or person, I don't know what they identify as, then, then we will do that. But I think it's about getting that engagement. So thank you, Stephen. I know that was a bit long and <laughs> I apologize. No, it's all right, it's all right. Um, would anyone else like to add on um, sort of microaggressions and services I can uh, union students support? Maybe Mr. Thomas, would you like to talk about it from the likes of student support? Yeah, thank, thank you very much, Stephen, again. Um, <clears throat> microaggressions are debilitating. Microaggressions are debilitating and it, it erodes one's self or essence of self, the self-confidence, self-esteem, and ultimately the well-being. Students of color, black students, BAME students, in fact, a lot of students outside of those groups face these microaggressions on a daily basis. But more so, I believe, given the context of this discussion, BAME students and black students in particular, they face these microaggressions all the time. For example, um, I noticed one of the questions mentioned about the um, the, the exploratory gazes by the um, the staff in the co-op shop, or you could um, compare that with the the challenges by library staff, or um, uh, the stop and search by the campus security. So I think combined, all these incidences and experiences they're quite debilitating. What this discussion has done for those um, across the university who don't have to um, deal with that on a daily basis and have no understanding of that, that th these discussions have illuminated those um, facts, right? They are subjective, they can't be proven, and oftentimes could be dismissed as you're probably hallucinating. So I think moving forward, um, it's very important for us as a university to understand the stories and to authenticate these stories um, because these stories are the ones that collectively shape students and staff's experiences. So I think that that has to be one of the um, one of the, the results that will come out of these discussions. And, you know, as, as I said previously, I have no reason to believe that we, we won't make tangible steps towards um, you know, broadening those understandings and addressing these issues. I have no reason to believe that, given the moment we are in. Um, this is a moment of opportunity and through collective action, I think collaboration between staff, students and senior management's commitment and match reduction, I have no reason to believe that we won't be the change that we want to see. So uh, I'm not sure if you know, that sort of uh, aligns with, you know, people's thoughts. But I genuinely believe illuminating the problems, that's the first step. And then having the commitment and then the checks and balances to ensure that these commitments or these promissory notes are in cash and act, acted upon. Those are important factors. Thank you very much, Mr. Thomas. If I could just uh, um, just bring the question back to Mrs. Hughes on uh, well-being, if you could just like, um, talk about from your perspective in terms of microaggression in the service services? So for me, this is a training issue and it is about uh, enabling our staff to understand the meaning of that, etc. That is actually in the training that staff receive. It's also part of, as I understand it, a relatively new initiative um, around building the anti-racist classroom. And so trying to make sure that um, there is huge awareness of this area. I mean, one of the areas to think about, and it's some work I did when I used to work at Sheffield Hallam, was we set up what we called listening rooms. And it, they, they were opportunities for to two friends to talk together around a topic. And the, um, um, the BAME award gap and microaggression was a, a central topic there as it is in many other universities. 
the data we had from that uh, program of work was incredible, enabling us to understand the real lived experience of many of our students. Because when two friends come together to talk, they've already got to a certain layer of understanding in that friendship, which enables you to have quite a rich depth of, un of understanding and, and, and data within it. And so I, I just put that out there as a way of, of, of thinking through some of the ways in which we can keep the dialogue going. Because that's really the important thing. It's about building understanding. It's about uh, developing capabilities and, 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 and dialogue between each of us so that we actually do understand when we say something that's offensive, that actually we said something that's offensive. Yes or we've acted in a particular way and we absolutely understand that we've acted in a particular way. So for me, that's the, the you know, a core part of the work we have to do li lies in that area. OK, thank you very, very much, uh, uh, Mrs. Mr. Hughes. Um, just off of that, lastly, I would like to point the last bit of the uh, microaggressions and the services and services in the last two timetable and the co-op shop. So, um, in the, in the likes of co-op, a lot of people feel as though they are racially profiled when they walk in and um, there's a lot of, as soon as, like I've actually, to be fair, as a black uh, uh, man, I've actually experienced that before where I walked in and somebody's like, are you paying for that? And I'm like, look, <laughs> I've got my car keys in my hand. I've got my, my card in my hand. I'm not leaving here until I pay. So um, in terms of the stuff, because some of the stuff tends to be students just like me uh, and um, how are, are what kind of training is put in play for them. Also, lastly, in the likes of timetable as, as well, and I can speak for myself as when I was ACS president, uh, one thing we found is that there was an unconscious bias, uh, sorry, there was an unconscious bias. So was there, is there, um, do timetable get an unconscious bias training when dealing with cultural societies from bookings? Because one thing we tend to uh, find is that um, we would have a room booking and then we'll be told that Oh well, you have to get the speakers that you have that you uh, um, you've invited approved, and in the process of getting them approved, we are waiting, 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 and once they are approved, we go back to, to question about the room, and the room booking is gone. And sometimes even we've had times where to say that they said that oh, for example, Wolf uh, Lecture Theatre was booked, but then when you've actually got there on the day of the actual event, uh, and we've had to reschedule or move things around, the 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 Wolf Lecture Theatre is not being used. You know, so how are the in these kind of aspects in timetable in the likes of co-op, what type of um, is there a certain training that goes past or are we is there anything put in to stop this unconscious bias that we actually find within within these um, two entities? Do you want me to ask? No, oh, sorry, Ad, can you hear me? Do you want me to answer about co-op shop? So just to say that it is unacceptable for people to be racially profiled um, and people should be getting the right training. Um, I, I think as Christina mentioned, it's about training. It's about understanding microaggressions. And as what um, Dave mentioned as well, the thing with microaggressions is they're quite insidious in the way that the person only experiencing them will feel them and the other person who is basically doing it doesn't understand that they are doing it um, and it is very hard to prove. So this is what, where we, we need to look at our, at our basic, the basic level of training that students and staff get. Um, and I think this is not just for, for example, co-op. I know it, it's framed in co-op, but for example, is there, and I think Richard actually mentioned it earlier, is there a level like a basic foundation level of where everyone is up to the same standard on the EDI training or just training in general. Um, because if we want you know, campus to be a welcoming place, we need to make sure that everybody is on the same page when it comes to what is acceptable and what isn't acceptable. Um, and that includes you know, um, bars and, and campuses and stuff like that. Um, so I think we need to look at our training and we need to not just look at it in the sense of, for example, uh, just co-op. And I think I'm speaking to the union about this and, and what they can do to basically enhance um, awareness among even sabbatical officers, for example. And I give personal experience is uh, me as a black woman who who is in my role. Um, it has been quite 
you know challenging being being in a leadership position um, and I think we as as leaders as well as um, other students get more criticism than for example our white counterparts um, so I've taken this back to the union and, I, and I've shared it with them and moving forward what they will be doing is they look they're re-looking at the EDI training and they're looking at what can they actually do to make people understand the the experiences others have felt and making them understand that they should be doing more it's not just about what is basically, you know, uh, the basic level of human decency? It's if you see it, call it out. And if if you if you don't see it and you don't call it out, then you're complicit in accepting that behaviour. And I think a lot of people are scared to be called racist. People are more scared to be called racist than actually calling out racist. So if we flip it on the other way around, if people are willing to learn about, you know, for example, the privileges that they bear both within, you know, the, the BAME community and without, um, you know, outside, be, meaning non-BAME. Um, so I think it, it's 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 a big topic and I think a lot of people need to understand their privilege and how to use it. Um, and that goes for union staff, it goes for university staff, and it goes for just students who are neither. OK, thank you very much, Sasha. Um, Mr. Reese, would you actually like to say something? Uh, I can I, I, I can try and address your point about timetabling, if that would be uh, that would be any help. And the honest answer is I don't know. Uh, so so I'm, I'm happy to take that one away and find out and get back to you. That's uh, that's the, the I'm not sure what the training is involved uh, in that. You know, clearly, we, we would hope that uh, there would be a level playing field for any any booking. It shouldn't make any difference as, as to where it comes from. But I'm just not aware of, of, of what issues are taking place. That. But I'm very happy to go and find out and get back to you. Thank you very much, sir. Appreciate it. Um, one question that's actually come through was, um, so somebody said, and this was about the, the colonising um, UKC. Um, I literally just have to scroll all the way back up. I do apologise. Um, so I'm going to pose two questions into one. So two weeks ago, around the time the Black Lives Matter protests picked up in the U uh, US, decolonized UKC shut down. Can anyone give any further details on this? A small follow up on this has the, uh, uh, on this. Has the recent demonstration from students over the past week or two changed the situation regarding decolonized uh, UKC shutting down? Also, in addition to this, um, somebody also said, uh, this is quite a long one, so I'm going to try and sum it up. Before the union's effort this year, specifically uh, DECOL UK, uh, U uh, University of Kent, has provided data to put forward issues of campus security's profiling, po policing, harassment of black students, black men in particular. Why has the uh, vice chancellor, head of security or anyone else, including student success officers, addressed this in the last year since the, the colonised University of Kent manifesto? What conversations did the Student Success Project and the university management have about the demands presented by the manifesto? Why were these put aside and then used as a way to present it as a work of or by the university in the recent statement? Um, when the university has not actually addressed any of these demands, are the, vi the vice chancellor, the executive group, the race champion, the student success officers, uh, are they willing to go back to these recommendations as well as um, current push for actual accountability for systematic institutional uh, racism instead of just black faces in high places or diversity. As a cop out to actually addressing issues of racial discrimination through campus security over policing tokenism in the form of diversity. Is the university willing to have difficult conversations going beyond tokenis tokenistic Wow. <laughs> Tokenistic diversity faces. Is the university willing to address its financial deficits as part of the issue of racist racial injustice on campus? Will it put uh, in less resources on campus security, new buildings, hiring actual racist professors? Does it have an actual commitment to social justice and not just for PR, marketing and unwillingness to account for its business before people approach? I know it was very long. I know maybe some things were, were lost in transit, but um, if um, everyone on this uh, on the panel could actually answer these um, queries to the best of their, their ability, that would be great. Um, Mrs. Cox, would you like to go first? Yeah, ha happy to. Um, yeah, I'm live now. Um, 
uh, I mean, wow. Well, I mean, there's just so much in that in that question that I'm obviously not going to be um, able to, to to answer it all. And and um, I suppose what I'm going to do is reflect uh, on what I'm currently thinking as I'm listening to um, what what colleagues and, and yourselves have been saying, and also reading what what's going on in the chat. I think I think up to um, address a number of issues about I just want to come back to the other the point that we've all been raising about um, racially motivated whether it's harassment violence uh, incidences on campus um, we, we've got to uh, I haven't got the answers we've got to do better on all of that and I think that the microaggression is a sort of continuum isn't it of the overt and obvious through to the this didn't feel right. That's not right. But actually, where, where do you take that? And and so I I just see there's just so much in there that we've got to we've got to um really look at how how we feed all of this into our policies. But it's not just policies. It's how we then live and use the policies that I think is is, is a, a real takeaway for me. The 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 decolonizing the curriculum. I saw that on the um about the the, the university joint statement with um. With, with Kent Union I, and I I, um, I suppose what I mean first of all I apologize if that's how it, it came over that somehow the university was uh, appropriating that in some way um, that really was not the intention rather um, it was to, to simply um, recognize that actually our students and our staff and, and we have you know I, I think we have to acknowledge as, as, as the vice chancellor's leadership this absolutely came from our students and our staff and our law school um, in particular um, really um, doing work on on uh, decolonizing uh, the curriculum initially and then decolonizing Kent um, that uh, we, we just simply wanted to, to know and flag I don't I apologize if it if it came over in a way that was was never intended um, I, I'm not I'm not uh, aware of anything um, about disbanding any of that so I I would welcome um, further information if, if there's anything that I can do around that and on that I'm very happy to so. Um, I mean, there's, there's so many um, issues raised this evening um, that, that there's no way that you know, those who've raised the questions are going to be able to go away and feel satisfied that we've answered anything. Probably all we're doing here is simply um, scratching the surface. Um, and and I, I just I wanted to acknowledge that. Um, I think we've got an opportunity to, to build on um, conversations that I know have already been going on and the conversations like this and to have more opportunities to listen to each other um, to commit to taking um, issues away and looking at how we can address them whether it is through a policy or procedure actually giving people feedback you know what we heard that this evening what do you think about that how might that make you think differently about what we do how we do it um, I think there are some common themes here that we can take away um, from the issues that have been raised and, and will help us shape um, uh, you know, our plans and working with, with Kent Union on, on that. Um, and Sasha's mentioned uh, um, the survey as well, and I think that will only add to, to um, if you like, a sort of body of, of, of evidence that gives us a sense of where are the, the, the issues that we need to, to maybe focus on first, actually. Um, so, so uh, uh, you know, Thanks, Stephen, for, for asking me to comment. Very happy to, but as I say, so much in that in that question. I hope I was able to address some of the issues around the, the decolonizing um, uh, and the statement issue. But um, but beyond that, I think there's just so much here for us to take away and come back um, in further conversations and as I say address it our themes. But it, it's it's just um, it, again, as I said, being able to to read this, see this, and engage in these conversations is is um, really important to me. Thank you very much. Would anyone else like to say anything else? Okay. Um, just going off of that, I think one thing I've actually taken away from today that I would actually like to reflect on, I think, is mainly the uh, EDI training. Maybe uh, uh, as a university, we do need to work on the EDI. I think that is a sense of uh, of, of uh, 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 maybe something that needs to maybe regulations or laws reformed and actually analysed to see why is there so many loopholes and why are we still facing the same levels of problem on campus within certain uh, uh, um, uh, 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 bodies, so for the likes of campus security or the likes of sabbatical officers or the likes of 
uh, um, staff on campus. I think that is something that we do need to take into account. I think even in the likes of some of the comments where I've actually seen people talk about lectures and, you know, the staff even hiring people that yeah. um, rate, uh, uh, apparently on their social media is overt, overtly racist, but we still hire them. I think these are the things that we actually need to take more detail into because I remember even one thing that we saw across the year that I think there was a level of uh, confusion about was even when I think um, somebody from the Israeli government came to the UK and a lot of Palestinians felt a type of way about it. So I feel like that that being said, maybe we do need to assess a lot of things on campus and even the likes of free speech and all that kind of stuff. And, um, you know, just to reform ourselves and actually make sure, making sure that we prevent certain things in terms of race uh, racism amongst our staff, you know, uh, uh, going on, you know. But I hand the floor, thank you very much, everyone. And I hand the floor, floor back to Sasha. Hello, everyone. Um, so we're coming to a natural end. I think this conversation can go on forever because it is quite broad. Um, but we, we will take on everyone's concerns that they have put basically on the chat because um, we've still got a lot of questions um, that, for example, are that haven't been published yet. Um, but what I want to bring everyone's attention to is the um, basically the survey that we have launched and um, Lloyd has put it down in the in the comments. I don't know what to call it. Comment section. Um, so please fill that out uh, and give us your feedback because that will be taken to the racial harassment steering group to create themes, to then to create tangible solutions. Um, and we will be taking on the recommendations that you also um, give in today to basically look at the current structures and see where they're not doing right and use your feedback to basically improve them to, to move forward. Um, but as we're coming to an end and also just touching on what Karen said about, for example, the statement, I think what we need to do is we, we all have a common goal. Everyone in this chat um, watching has a common goal. We want to make sure that, you know, campus is safe for everyone. We want to make sure that if someone's calling me. Um, we want to make sure that um, everyone has a better experience on campus. Um, and for example, the statement that was released, um, whether it was released or not released, I think, you know, it would have still got criticism. But I think what we need to also come together is we need to criticize, but we also need to say what they need to do better. And I know, for example, some students have mentioned in the, in the comments is, um, you know, empty statements mean empty statements. And what the university needs to start doing is with their statements, they need to say, OK, this has happened. What are we moving forward? And I know I'm working, for example, with Miles in corporate comms to, to work on basically the next steps for students to see. So I think that's one of the really important things. Um, and I think it's just it's good to see we all have a you know common goal and we should be all working to towards it. Um, and it, it, it's a process um, and we need to start moving forward with it. And I always say two steps forward and one step back is, is still a step forward. And in, in the society that we live in, it's going to be extremely hard, but we've got to start somewhere. So with the right people in the room, hopefully we can we can create that change. Leading on to more of an end, I wanted to thank the panel, but even more so, I wanted to thank Stephen um, in his role as BAME Student Network Chair. Um, you know, the year has not been easy, trust me. <laughs> um, and I think you've done a brilliant job, um, especially, you know, having the leading voice on the Black Lives Matter protests um, that have been happening alongside um, Toby and Kundai. I think it's been really, really brilliant. And I think, you know, the, the community has got a shock of their life. So, you know, this change is starting here and it is all about dialogue. So we need to keep this momentum going. And, and you know, when the hashtags stop, people need to still start speaking about just racial inequality for everyone within, you know, the B BAME community as well. As well. Sa Sasha, can I, Sasha? Yeah. Yes. Oh, yeah, my signal dropped earlier, so I, I got kicked out of the meeting. So oh, can sorry. I just add, sorry, can I just add, first of all, my um, my commendations to you and your team for doing a fantastic job for this year. You know, as I mentioned to you um, privately, if you want to add something to your CV, I think this would be it, right? This is the X factor. But on a serious note, you, you know, you guys have, have done a good job in a very difficult period, uh, a, a really, really um, defining period. And also to Stephen as, as you, you graduate. So congratulations, both of you. But what I would say, um, a, a note on this uh, conversation, I don't believe it's about statements. I believe statements are um, invitations to treat, as I would call it. Right. Um, what I believe is you, the use of language around equity, diversity and inclusivity 
it's, it's, it's evolving and mm. we should be allowed to use it clumsily, right? We are going to be clumsy. There's no, there's no um, you know, established jargon, right? There's no, no language for this, mm. right? And it will be clumsy. But what I would urge everyone to, to really have a look at is the intentions behind it and to support, you know, the, to provide the support that we collectively as a community can shape this community for a better community where we can all grow, belong, achieve, attain and flourish, right? And I think a multiplicity of voices is important in this conversation. We have to, we have to encourage that. Otherwise, you know, what, what, what is the point of this exercise? So I think a solution focused approach is always going to be the best approach, right? Mm -hmm. Presenting that platform where we can hear these voices similar to the ones that we've been hearing today. And also, you know, the due diligence process where we can institute the checks and balances, you know, are the promissory notes converted into actual cash purchases, right? So I would just, you know, as I said, really everyone has a responsibility to play in this. And collectively, as a as a community, we can make marginal gains on these issues, and we should really believe that we can. Otherwise, there's no point in having these discussions. Yeah, no, that that is true. Um, and just to just to add to that as well is um, just to emphasise that student support and wellbeing is here for students. Um, you can access the free counselling services, so please make sure you get in touch. Um, and we will have another follow up um, in conversations, um, you know, following the next maybe in September or the next coming coming months as well to keep to keep this conversation going. But thank you for everyone who's coming and um, hopefully we'll see you soon. Also, just to interject before <laughs> everyone actually goes. Um, so if you are a BAME student and you like to see any future events going on, because one thing I must say before I, I leave is as the BAME Network Chair, we did have we used to do at least once, twice a term, um, a basically sit down where you'd actually come and talk about your grievances as a BAME student on campus and, you know, the things that um, university is doing right and the things that the university is wrong. And attendance was a slack, I must say so myself. So please, guys, please keep updated. Uh, um, obviously, now my, 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 my role as BAME Network Chair is unfortunately coming to an end, especially with the fact that I'm graduating. However, just in, uh, um, for the likes of the next BAME Network Chair, uh, um, please, if you could follow the BAME Student Network page, please, 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 this is your safe haven. This is where you could actually find people like my, my, yourself, the BAME Network Chair, communicate your grievances, and they could act as the voices to voice your complaints to the Kent Union. Um, in the likes of the Union Executive Committee office, uh, office meetings and make the change that we want to see. We shouldn't, you know, the reason why uh, people like me are here is to actually push for change at the University of Kent and make sure that our, um, being the representation for every other BAME student on campus, whether you're a Black, whether you're Asian, whether you're a minority, my role is to make sure that we get see the relevant change and to push for it. So please, guys, if we, on Facebook, if you could follow the BAME Student Network um, on, on, on Facebook. Um, also, if you would to, uh, like to see more about our movement on the Black Lives Matter Kent, follow BLM Kent on Instagram. But um, once again, I would like to say a big, 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 big thank you to our lovely panelists, Karen, Mr. Dave Thomas, um, Mr. Reese, Mrs. Hughes, Mrs. Cox, Sasha, you guys have been great. You know, um, we do appreciate all of the work that you're doing and, you know, the uh, constant push for change. And I hope and pray that even after myself and Sasha is gone, that uh, a change comes and it comes to stay. And it's not something where to say we just talk about it now and it goes back under the pipeline, but it is actively being implemented on a day to day basis. Thank you so much, everyone. God bless you. And I hope you have, all have a lovely day. And thank you for everybody who tuned in. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stephen. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Sasha, as well. Yeah, thank you, Sasha. And colleagues.